I am Marcelo. Hello, everyone. I work for a company called Invica. I'm the head of training there. I take care of how people learn in the company and how the, how the organization learns as well. I like organizational problems. So if you have organizational problems, come and talk to me. And um, I created a tool called PHP Spec. Any of you familiar with PHP Spec? OK, some of you. And uh, I do agile transformations for organizations. I got an award <laughs> for that. Best agile coach of the UK. Impressive to wear you know, those penguin suits and stuff like that and one night out. <laughs> and I also wrote recently a functional programming, um, functional structures library in PHP called Funky. Um, I also like coffee. And I, I, li I like chess, so if you are in chess.com, I am Marcelo underscore Duarte, play with me. <laughs> I sometimes lose for Croatians because they're really good in chess. How many people here are actually from Croatia? Wow, it's uh, half of the room. Okay, cool. Uh, what, where are the rest of you from? Austria. Austria, Belgium, Italy, Belgium, Belgium Spain. Spain. Wow. Anybody outside of Europe? OK, close enough. UK still counts at Europe. <laughs> OK, so what you're going to see today, you're gonna we're going to think about things functionally. We're going to talk about how do you think about things function, functional thinking. I cannot promise you you're going to learn functional programming in three hours. Uh, I've been doing that for many years, and I still don't know how to do functional programming. <laughs> But I, I'm going to give you, I, I'm going to try and give you an intuition of how this works. We're going to spend quite some time in algebraic data types. These are the building blocks of domain modeling and for functional programming. So if you, if you learn the basic algebra, then it's just a matter of utilizing the basic algebra and then create new algebras that are associated with your, with your domain. So that's what we're going to spend some time doing. And we're going to learn some tactical modeling techniques. Uh, how many of you are already doing DDD, Domain Driven Design? OK, so Domain Driven Design, it's broken down into strategical modeling and tactical modeling. And today, we're not going to cover strategical modeling. This is like part two of this workshop. Strategical modeling is particularly useful if you have more than one bounded context, and you will have more than one bounded context. And you need to know, you need to make sure that uh, they communicate with each other. So it's basically laying out an architecture that uh, allows for the bounded context to communicate with each other. And there are many ways you can do that. It will be different for functional programming than you do when you do that in non-functional languages. Functional programming leverage on the fact that they can do asynchronous programming very, very efficiently as well. And, uh, uh, and they have specific techniques to leverage strategical modeling, which we're not going to cover today. I will give you references at the end of the day for you to continue diving into this and what you can learn, how you can learn this even further. We're going to look into the life of domain objects in, 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 when they live in the domain. When you create domain objects, when you have to make them work, what, you know, how does it look like, and when you have to persist them and uh, you know, create side effects on your application. You heard me, side effects, it's part of life. <laughs> Live with it. <laughs> Further topics uh, recommended for you to look after this workshop is strategical domain modeling in the context of functional programming. You do that with reactive programming, mostly. Um, some sort of messaging strategies, events, and services between bounded contexts, reactive Programming in general is really important if you want to become a functional programmer. And do you want to become a functional programmer? Is there any future in that? Let's clarify that now. Is PHP a functional programming language? No, it is not. What is a functional programming language? Hard to define, but will make it easy for you to have immutability. You make it easy for you to have purity. You make it easy for you to have first class functions, scurrying lazy, uh, 
context, you have uh, some algebraic data types by, by default, and you have higher kinded types. We haven't got many of these requirements in PHP. We can, we can create first class functions. We're going to look into that. We can use fun functions as first class citizens and higher order functions. We can do that. We can create ADTs in PHP. Funky is an ADT uh, library. Uh, we can, it's very hard to create immu immutability in PHP. Almost impossible. I would say close to impossible unless you have a, a C extension. And uh, it's really hard to keep uh, purity in, 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 in PHP. But we can use PHP to learn these things and we have to learn these things. Back in 2000, 1999, when many of us starting playing with PHP, no, not you, but you look so young, <laughs> you make me feel embarrassed. <laughs> but back in the day when we started uh, PHP, uh, PHP wasn't an object-oriented language. You couldn't even have a class in PHP. There was no class data structure in PHP, in PHP 3. Uh, that was introduced in PHP 4. And even in PHP 4, it was like a, a, an array with ster steroids. Everything was public. Um, and that it was only with Zend Engine 2 was written, I think, 2004, 2003, something like that. The PHP 5.0 introduced a better implementation of object-oriented. So nowadays, is the prevailing paradigm. We do object-oriented imperative programming in PHP. So yes, things change. Uh, there is future in functional programming. I've seen the future. It's all functional, believe me. It's all there. It's the duty of all software engineers to learn functional programming. And I convince you by this. Um, you can see that there's a lot of direction in, in pro, uh, um, a lot of things happening around asynchronous programming. Yeah, have you experienced that? A lot of, a lot of things happening in parallel on the internet right now. And a lot of things being distributed. You, you, computers are becoming very, very powerful. And uh, functional languages are, born in, are being born every day. It's really hard to avoid uh, going to a conference and not having one functional talk. Uh, this, this workshop was sold out. I did another one in the Netherlands, sold out. And uh, there's a lot of attention and a lot of interest around functional programming. If you don't learn functional programming, you're going to be left behind as a programmer. Uh, so do learn functional program. You have to learn functional program as a part of your profession. Whether you're going to do that in PHP or not, it all depends on how PHP is going to grow. Uh, but you need to learn functional programming. Uh, a word of preprocessors. Because PHP does not support many of the syntax which is friendly to functional programming, right now PHP is doing, uh, with doing functional programming with PHP is similar to how you do functional programming with JavaScript. You use some preprocessors. Preprocessors are not, f uh, are not popular in PHP because functional programming is not popular in, P in PHP. Preprocessors are quite popular in JavaScript. And if, if, if they adopted preprocessors, eventually we're going to adopt preprocessors as well. So there will be some preprocessing <laughs> shown on slides. Please don't jump into judgment. Open your mind. Things will change. <laughs> uh, functional programming is complex. Um, don't be misled by me. I will show all of these three hours that we're going to spend together. It's gonna, everything is going to appear very simple. But this is just Marcelo's magic. This thing is complicated. And, and do dedicate time to learn this and get your muscles, your mental muscles working around this. And don't be shy. And eventually, you will become, um, you will become your sec second nature. Functional programming is going to be the way you think about things if you, if you get, jump into it. All right? So that's my disclaimers. <laughs> and so the agenda is functional programming, algebraic data types, some domain modeling, and then domain block lifecycle, which covers the creation, uh, utilizing the domain objects, and then persisting it. For you to make the most of this workshop, you, uh, I would ask you to please uh, all silence your mobile if you haven't yet. 
um, I would ask you to uh, stay away from um, work, email, Skype, Slack, blah, 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 and stay here, otherwise you get lost. So this is going to be a very fast-paced workshop, and for you to benefit, I recommend you try to stay away from outside communication. It's up to you. If you have to take a call, if you have to be on sport or something, up to you. I recommend you, sh you shun them off. Tweet loads. If you tweet, you remember stuff that you saw afterwards. If you, you remember what you tweeted and how that connected to the slides and what you learned. So if you've seen an idea that you like, tweet it or write it down. But tweeting is good as well. Uh, there is a code of conduct, which basically means don't be an animal. Be nice to everybody. <laughs> Treat everybody uh, friendly. This conference is about friendship, making friends, making new connections, staying in contact uh, afterwards, and treat everybody uh, better than how you'd like to be treated yourself. And um, if you have any problem, if you, feel any, uh, if you feel uncomfortable, you can approach the staff. It's amazing staff. They're very nice people. Talk to them, and they will try and work out uh, a solution for you. Uh, be on time after the break. If you're not on time, I will start without you, and I will respect those who came on time. <laughs> Participate, ask questions, otherwise it's going to be really hard. There are slides that ask for questions, and if you don't ask questions, then, you know, uh, I'm going to move forward. <laughs> okay, and do the exercises. You're going to have like five to ten minutes for different exercises. All right, do the exercise. Try to do the exercises. Okay. So... Let's start with a short intro for functional programming. Ah. Okay, so what is functional programming? Programming with functions. Okay, so what is a function? It's a special value. It's this value that translates a value into another value. It's something that you can move around, but it's, you know, it's this bad magic value that can be transformed into another value. It's just... Um, think of a function as a value that can move about. Okay, like a map from one thing to another thing. Like a powerful switch. Yeah. Pure functions. An, an expression involving a pure functions is preferential transparent. Okay. Everybody familiar with referential transparency? Okay. So referential transparency is important because if, it, if you have, have a function and a function called inside of an expression and that expression is referentially transparent, then that function called and that function is pure. So let's, let's look at that referential transparency. Very simply, what does that mean? So there's only two things you need to know about. Referential transparency. So that's that's a property of every expression. So every line of code, every variable assignment, and anything you do. Every line. Every expression that you write in your program is an expression, right? So that those expressions can be referentially transparent if they can be replaced by the value resulted of the expression. Number one. If you can replace that expression by the resulting value, then you've got referential transparency. Maybe that. This is the it's Large, large, large. My head is too small. So, referential transparency is two things can be replaced, you can replace the expression by the value result in that expression. If you can do that, it's referentially transparent. And will not modify the results. So let's have an example because it's easier that way. So look at this. Look at this example. I couldn't find any simpler example. Right? So x equals 42, always. Right? So if you look at that expression there, y equals x plus 43, and you know it's going to be 42 because x is 42, and so the result is going to be y equals 
45, right? I can replace my x with the value, 42, and I'm going to get the same result. All right? When you do stuff like that, your expression is referentially transparent. So if that x was a function, a function call, that function always returned 42, then you will be referentially transparent and the function will be pure. It's easy, no? Easy peasy. Boom. That's referentially transparent. So a function is pure when it can always be replaced by the same returned value. That's pure functions. There's two rules. For every x, always have the same y. For the same input, always the same output. And there are no side effects. So side effects are things, other things that happen apart from the return value appearing. And like throwing an exception is, is also a side effect. Or saving to the database or echoing stuff or you know, any, anything useful. <laughs> It's a side effect. So you can't do anything useful in functional programming. If you do anything useful, it's not a pure function. Clear? <laughs> Everything that has side effects, then it's not a pure function. So a function is you put a value and get a, a value returned. Don't worry about the useful stuff. It's going to come later. We're gonna <laughs> OK. So questions. I have questions to wake you up. This function here, is it pure? Why? Yeah, always the same result. OK? And second rule? Any side effects? No side effects. So, boom, pure. Very good, very good. What about this one? Is it pure? Why? Same, same result, always. And no side effects. Yeah? Good. This one? Why? Random? Ah, random. Okay, so that's nasty. Dirty function. What about this one? What? Side effect, which one? Exception, very nice. Good. What questions do you have? So, PHP functional features. What do we have? We've got anonymous functions. Yeah? Everybody familiar with this? So this is a function that has no name. OK? And you can pass that to a variable. The only thing to not forget is to put the semicolon at the end. Boom, boom. Otherwise, it's a problem. OK? So that's very useful. It's useful to have anonymous functions because you can then return functions. Function can return functions. And everything in life changes when a function can return a function. Look at the square. The square is a function that returns a function that um, multiplies a number by itself. And you're going to think, why would I want something like that? So you can see an example that the square, square is being returned. And then you call square to 2, that will return 4. Not particularly useful at the moment. But these are, you, you see that this is how you compose stuff. When you have functions that can be composed with other functions, you'll see in a, in a second. Note that I'm, I'm using the return value here, a callable. I could have used the return value closure in this context as well. So in PHP, the, the type closure can be used to signify anonymous functions when you're passing or receiving. You can use callable in a more broad way. Uh, for example, you can call, you can receive a callable, and a callable can be a string or a number of other things. So you're going to see what can be callable. But, and, but when you say closure, you cannot receive a string, or you cannot receive other types of callables. You have to receive an anonymous, anonymous function. Um, function can receive function as arguments. So look at a, this function is taking a function as arguments. The previous one was returning a function. This one is, is receiving a function as arguments. So now I'm, I'm, I'm passing my square to my power of 16. 
And what I can do now is that I can create a square root of 16, so 16 times 16. So you could potentially create a power of, you can multiply 16 for any multiplier that you like. So this is how you start composing functions with another. So these functions, they can return functions and or receive functions as arguments. They are called higher order functions and the bread and butter of functional programming. So PHP also have uh, some implementation of closure. So uh, closure is when you, you've got this, you see inside you have this anonymous function. And the anonymous functions knows about scope that comes from outside the anonymous functions. So you are enclosing some lexical scope. Okay, in this case is the variable divisor. I'm bringing the, div the, the variable divisor into the closure. All right? And other languages, you don't have to use the use keyword. In PHP, you do. See? Some implementation of closure. Use keyword there to bring the variables into the, the scope. OK? Karim is converting a function of many arguments into a function of one argument. Okay, so you've got uh, this function that takes two arguments, takes a, uh, an index and a string, and when you call it, it will return the particular position in a string. So now I want to convert that function into a function with one argument only. Okay, so what do I do? First thing, I return a function return a function. Everything in life ret starts with returning a function. Don't forget that. So how do you do this? I have to return a function. And then what do I do after? And then, ah, it doesn't matter. So I will return a function with the second arguments that I needed. <laughs> okay? So notice that the first function, top function return, uh, receives the first arguments. The second function takes the second argument. And I bring the other argument into the scope using the use keyword. And then I do the combination of the two. This way, all of your functions can have just one argument. Why would you want something like that? Because you want to combine functions with functions, and you don't want to worry about how many arguments they take. You say, I want to combine that with that, with that, with that, and at the end, pass one single argument at the end. And then, you, you know, psh, everything gets done. There's a function that you can write called combine, and that takes a, a list of functions, and then you just want to pass the argument and then the, your state, initial state and end, and then it just proop, combines everything together. Okay? That's why you want functions with one argument. In uh, Haskell, all functions are one, one argument. So they are naturally combinable. So it is, in PHP, this is how you convert your functions to one argument, with currying. This is called currying. It's named after Haskell Curry. You know, he's not the guy who invented curry, but he worked on curry as well, currying in. Um, he was the third person to ever touch this uh, material. And the Haskell language people, they named the language after him. And they asked uh, the wife, can, we, can you use the name your, your husband name for the programming language? He said, sure you can. He hated his name, but if you want, you can. <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> so that's where the name comes from. Invoke magic method. Any, anybody familiar with this? There's a magic method. Magic reminds me of your key keynote. It's a kind of magic. <laughs> so the invoke magic method allows you to, you, you, you can use a, a, a class, so you, the objects of that, those class like a function. So imagine this class, div by, it has an invoke method, it takes an argument, and uh, when instantiated, it takes a divisor, and when you call the invoke, you pass a dividend. So here's the invoke magic method. The, then you instantiate the, the class like, the object like this, div by two, 
and then you can say div by two four, like it like it's a function call, right? You don't need to call any methods. Okay, another way to create um, callables. So a strategy that we use a lot when we're writing functional programming in PHP is wrapping callables in a class. This is also called the reader monad. Don't worry too much about the names. But basically what you can do is to create the, the class with a, with a callable and you have a method called run. And, and then you call the operation that you have um, um, encapsulated. You can call it with a method run at some point in the future. Okay? This will become very useful later. Okay? So, names, namespace your functions. PHP does not have an autoloading technique yet, a standard autoload technique for uh, functions. Nevertheless, you have to namespace your everything, every function you write, because other people will be writing functions as well, and they will pollute the global space. So you have to have namespace for your function. Another trick is to use a constant right on the top of your function. Then when you're passing uh, callables around, uh, you can just pass the constant name. It looks much more elegant than a string for the name of your function. And, and if it's namespaced, it's going to be a huge string. So you don't want that. So you want to create a constant right, at, right on top of your functions. So there are many ways to pass callables around in PHP. So here's some of the ways. You can pass it as a string. In this case, string pause is a PHP function. And you can pass, you can pass as the anonymous function. You can pass as an invocable object. You can pass as an array with the two elements. The first element is the name of the class. The second one is a static method of that class. You can pass as an object and a public method of that object. You can also use uh, anonymous classes with invocable in them. There are many ways. And here is an example of including a namespace that has functions and constants in them. You can do everything in one line in PHP. And uh, here's an example of uh, using the constant name as a, um, as a callable name. Okay, ready for questions? Give me a way of passing a callable around in PHP. Anybody listening? Yeah. An array with object and a function. An array with an object and a method. What else? Anonymous function. Anonymous function, yes. Another. Invocable. Sorry? Invocable. Invocable. One more. Yeah. A string. A string. Okay, good. What are higher order functions? Yes, functions who take and or ret uh, return functions. What is a closure? Sorry? Yes, a, f a function that can bring in a variable into the lexical scope, lexical scope into the, the, uh, the anonymous function. Good. How is type hinting closure different than callable? Yeah. Yes, callable also accepts strings and arrays and that kind of thing. Okay? Closure does not even accept uh, invocable, so be aware of that. Okay? What are we going to cover? So algebraic data types. Um, we're going to talk about some types, a way to model data that can be of one type or another type. Prototypes, it's a way to model types who can be made of a, a number of other types, okay? So A can be a B and an N, okay? Not or, but and. And uh, we're going to talk about structural recursion, which is a way of decomposing these types and, and getting the things from inside of it and operating on it. And then type constructions. So type constructions are 
types that, that can be made, that can construct other types. So like, like a class construct objects, a type constructor construct types. All right? Some types. So some types, very, very simple idea. So an A can be a B or a C. Okay, classical example, Boolean. Boolean can be true or false, okay? So if you have to implement something like that in PHP, it would be something like this, with the caveat that you, um, you should not be able to, ex to extend A beyond B and C. So you have to implement some way of preventing A to being extended further. Okay? That's the idea. Okay, but don't worry too much about that for now. Okay? Everybody got it? It's very simple. So when do we use some types? We use some types very often when we have transition of states. So if you're modeling a process in your organization that you know has this status and that status and that state, things moves from one status to another, or when you have variation of the same concepts. The same concept can be broken down into various concepts. Very close to how you'd, you, you'd use inheritance in the old days, if you code it like that, when you learn object-oriented programming, you use inheritance everywhere, right? Oh, similar to polymorphism as well, OK? For object-oriented people, which is all of us. <laughs> OK, prototypes. So prototypes are types uh, which and need to be uh, expressed with a collection of other types as well. For example, A is a B and the C. Uh, so if you have to implement, it would be something like this. Class A, it's constructed with a B and a C. Simple? Okay? We call this prototype because imagine that the class A was taking two booleans. So, um, where, when you have some types, you, you, if, it's, if it's just A or B, you end up only have two values, value one plus value two. If it's, if it's a sum type, it's a multiplication of possible results. Then here, you'd have either a true or a false for A, either a true or a false for B. You have four types, two times two is, is four, okay? That's why it's called product types. This comes from uh, Cartesian products. You have you end up having twice, uh, you have to multiply the number of uh, values on the other set. When you have some types, you just add the types together. That's where it comes from. Very simple. So prototypes, it's used when you have composite types. And when your state is represented by a computation of values of other types. Okay? Which is very often, right? So let's look at structural recursion. So recursion is very powerful, and structural recursion is very, very important concept to understand. We do that all the time with polymorphism, and we grown to, to hate it, right? It was very beautiful in the beginning, when, very beautiful idea. And then you've got something like this, you create a class, and you extend it, say, say you have an account, yeah, and your account can be a green account, a gold account, and a closed account. Green account, you have, you exchange your stars for a coffee when you get 10 stars or 15 stars. If you have a gold account, you only need 10 stars. Okay? Or your account can be closed. Yeah? Everybody drink coffee, right? Kava? Is it Kava? Kava. How do you say black coffee? Sorry? Sedna. Sadna kava. Sadna kava. Sounds like Japanese. Sadna kava. Okay. And then you have... Uh, so if you have to implement uh, the method claim, you have to implement in every subclass if they have a separate implementation of it. So I'm claiming with the green card, I check if I have enough stars, and then I return a new green card with minus 15 stars. If it's a gold card, I only take 10 stars. Yeah? Everybody written code like that? You just have to implement the method in every subclass, right? 
Yeah, you've been there? <laughs> Sorry. So in functional programming, we deconstruct the values with pattern matching. Uh, pattern matching is available in, in my library, the funky library. Uh, and without preprocessor, it looked like that. So you can match an account. If, he, if it's a green account, then you, you can deconstruct the value. So the value from inside of the green class can be put into that variables that you can reuse to create logic. And so if it's a gold account, it's minus, oh, should be minus 10. Uh, fix, fix, fix. Do not confuse anybody. OK. If it's, a, if it's a green card, minus 15. If it's a gold card, minus 10. If it's a closed card, we just on a closed card. If you use preprocessors, so there's a library called preprocess.io. You can go to the website if you're interested in that. Then it looks like that. It's a lot cleaner. OK? And then you can add code around it as well. If you have minimum stars, then match like that. OK, so this is both approach com compared. The top one is without any preprocessors. The bottom one is with the preprocessors. OK, type constructors. So type constructors are a way of creating types. So it's a type that can create another type. OK? Or I, I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit. So you've got a type, and that type may have something else or may not have anything after that. For example, the result type, I can start very simply with a, a, a sum type. Say a result can be good or bad. OK? But say if my result is good, I want to see the value of the result as well. With me so far? So my good result should be a prototype. I want my good result to have the actual value of the result in it. So my result type will, be kind, will become a type constructor because it will take another type to be created. So it will be a result of, so the good result will be a good result of a string or a good result of an account, of something, OK? So you have a type of another type, so, OK? So you have a result of question mark is a good of question mark or bad. So the bad is a nullary type because it doesn't take any parameters, any other type as a parameters. And the result and good are unary type because they take one argument for the type constructor. In this case, it's generic. It, I don't know what it is. OK? In PHP, you can do that by omitting the type hinting. <laughs> you, you don't have generics, but generics is available. Just don't put type hinting. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so you've got. Um, you're dedu deducting stars, and, and the deduction of the stars will return a result. If, it, if, I, have, if I have enough stars, I get a, a good result. If I don't have enough stars, I get bad results. OK? So here, uh, Marco is an example where you could replace your ex uh, errors with a, a type. OK, one very common example case of this is the option monad. It, it does exactly what I showed you, but it's more like uh, the language that you see. You're not going to see result good or bad. You're going to see options. But it's exactly the same thing. An option can be a sum or a none. So think of a sum as a good result and a none as a you know, bad result. So an option of something is a sum of something or a none. Okay? And it, it works exactly the same way as you saw now the, the result. So you should now be able to go and do some coding. And you be, I, I believe you've been given a, a virtual machine. You should now pull the repository, because the exercises are there. And um, 
to run the test, you need to uh, do composer test 3, 3A, which is the number of the exercise. And you should go to the lesson 3. And inside of lesson 3, you have this exercise where you need to fill in the, the results. You've got about 10 minutes to do this one. So another very similar pattern is the either monad. Um, it looks very similar, uh, but imagine that, like Marco was saying before, you have a bad result. You want to know the kind of result you had exactly. You want to know what was the error message. So if you're using options, you don't have that. You just have. It, it was bad. That's all I have to tell you. It was bad. But you don't, you don't know why it was bad. So the either monad is a way of resolving that. Either, either monad is a type constructor. Of, uh, it, it takes two types. So it has um, a E on the left and V on the right. OK? So you say, I either, is, I either of EV is a left of E or a right of V. OK? Which basically means that if you have a left value, it would be of the type uh, E, and the right value would be of the type V inside of it. Is that clear? So if you have an error, it would be some sort of uh, error class. And if you have um, a value, it will be whatever type is that type of that value. OK? And by convention, the left is the bad E, and the right is the good E. OK? By convention. If everything that is in the right is good, everything that is in the left is bad. It doesn't have to be, but it's convention. Where does the convention come from? Um, I, I think it goes back to the Roman Empire. They used to call left sinistra, which is in English is sinister. <laughs> Everything lefty is kind of work of the devil. If you wrote with the left hand, you're like which? They used to burn people who were left-handed. So you have to learn to write with the right hand. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's, why, that's where it comes from. <laughs> you didn't think I had an answer to that. <laughs> 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 okay. Deduct. So you can see now the deduct method would have a right or a left. And they're both either's. Okay? So now, because you, do, you did the option exercise, you can do the either exercise in half of the time. Because it's actually the same thing, just have an error message there. Just go in a 3B file should be very straightforward. Anybody needs more time? No, OK. Did you arrive at a solution like that? Yeah? Very, very easy, simple. Should we use either all the time? It looks like it's a good solution. We arrived at a good solution. Should we stick to it? No. Either is right biased, so the implementation, implementation of either, so every time you do, you're doing operations on an either monad, um, you're not going to even look what's in the left. You're just going to you know, ignore what's in the left. Um, you're going to see that very soon when we talk about combinators. Combinators are ways of linking these monads together. So you can have, are you familiar with those 
if else, if else, if else, it looks like a Christmas tree. You can kiss goodbye to those things, because now you have composition. You can just combine these monads together. We're going to learn very soon how to do that. And these combinators, they completely ignore what's on the left side. So either monad, uh, uh, it's biased. We want other solutions for that. Um, these junctions, also called validation in Scala Z, I keep the name validation because it's nicer than this junction. I think this junction is like you know, calling someone some name or something. You are disjunction to the human race. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so I call it validation. A validation class can be a success or a failure. Okay? And so very similar to the, to the either monad, one thing you're going to be able to do with validation is that you're going to be able to um, loop through a series of validations and then combine them all together and return a collection of validation classes, which is, it can be really useful if you're building like web forms, for example. It returns all the errors nicely for you, that can be then combine all the errors in a, in a list, then you can then place on the, or a map, then you can then place on your variables on the form. It's really, really nice. So the implementation is very, very similar to the either monad, so there's not much explanation that goes here. So bear in mind, validation is going to be our choice for, for the future. That's all you need to know for now. So what we've done so far, we've done some types, prototypes, Structural recursion, type constructors, and have you got any questions? Composition, we are ahead of time. Uh, now I can relax a bit. Composition, okay? The whole point of functional programming is composition. That's the, the main reason why you do this. It's incredible the incredible power of composition of functional programming, it's something that it will blow your mind when you, when you realize what's actually happening in your code. Um, you've got these things called combinators that you can add to your monads. These combinators are well-established patterns. They've already been written for you. There are heaps of them around. You can just use them, which allow you to combine all of these monads together and, and write programs that are really, really descriptive. You can read the program in a much better way than you would if it was written in a very imper interactive way. Have a look at, for example, this piece of interactive code. We all have written code like that. Yeah? Very right, straightforward. You're trying to get you, you try to know if someone needs to top up, you, but it's inside of, inside of something, a class. OK? There are no uh, many other alternatives to this, except to um, ex expect that it will never return a null. Then you can write better, more look, good looking code. But no had cost some money in our industry. In, in the number of bugs that it has generated. The gentleman who invented the null uh, type estimated that he costed us one billion dollar <laughs> in bugs. No, po no pointer exception. Even if you're not a Java coder, you have seen no pointer exceptions a lot. Okay? So you, this is how you have to code if you want to avoid no po new pointer x, you have to test everything to see if it's returning a null or not, which is tedious. So if you use a combinator, you can avoid that, and you can combine computations much, much, much more um, elegantly. The first combinator we're going to look at is the map combinator, which apply a function to a value inside of a, an algebraic data type. Okay. So it's very easy to understand maps because you've done this your whole life. Now I'm talking like Morpheus. <laughs> you've done this, you've seen this your whole life, right? Uh, array map. 
when you do an array map, you pass a function to that, and then you want that function to execute in every element of the array. So the, the array, imagine the array is an algebraic data type. So a list is an algebraic data type. But imagine if the array is. And you, you say, hey, Mr. Array, you are a context. You are a computational context. I'm going to give you a function. Can you please lift this function to your reality and apply to every of your members? So that's what we do. We got that function lifted in the context of the array, and we would create another array. Okay? The map will generate another array, which has all the values transformed by that function. That's what map does. Map gets the value inside of the algebraic data type, apply a, a, a function to the elements of the algebraic data type, and return the new algebraic data type with the value transformed by the function. OK? Doesn't have to be a list. It can be an option. It can be an either. It can be a validation. It can be a future. It can be any kind of mona. OK? Uh, actually, it can be even less than a monad. It can be something called a functor. A functor only needs to have m uh, the map uh, combinator. If something, if, if some algebraic data type only has a map uh, combinator, it's not even called a monad. It's that simple, so simple, it's called a functor. A functor is an abstraction over a value that you can then, uh, you can then lift a function into it. So you've got this option of a user. You can map over that user, and you can get the card back. OK? Now, the get card method, it's returning a card. But when you get it out, you get a sum of a card. Just like when you do an array map, you get something back inside of an array. Same thing. OK? So get card is returning a card, but the value returned by this operation is a sum card. Good? OK. What if I don't have a user? What if I have like a, a none? It's going to break my code, right? No, you won't. It was just return a none, which I can continue mapping. You see where this is going? You don't have to stop to ask questions to the computer. You can just tell the computer what to do. Right? So you can die. Put many of them together, get a user, get the car, get the amount, keep going that way. So let's have a look on the first one. OK? So this is going to convert into that. Some card. And then you can map the card to get the amount of the card. OK? Now, if, you, if you're more careful and you code all your functions that can return nulls or something like that to return options instead, it changes everything. If something can return a null, just create a type that indicates that can return a null. Use that type. Use types instead of uh, putting ifs everywhere in your code. So that's an option of a card. There's an option of an amount. So here, if you, if you now return, uh, if that get card is returned a sum of a card, you are in trouble. Because you, got a, you don't have a sum of a card anymore. You have a sum of a sum of a card. Right? That's no good. So we need to solve that problem. But we're going to solve that problem after the exercise. In the exercise, only think about the map combinator for the option ADT, 3C. Go for it. All right? Should we come together again? So the implementation is if something, if the object is a sum, then I will return a new sum with the function applied to the value of the sum. <coughs> OK? Otherwise, I just return a none. Was this simpler than what you thought? <laughs> <laughs> now, remember we had the problem, this problem, 
Yeah. Sorry, about the, the solution you gave, uh, yeah. just asking about preferences, would you be okay with implementing the method in the child? Process? Yes. Is that okay? Is there it's okay. Level? It's okay. Um, yeah, probably easier. The reason why I did this in this particular, I'm limited to, to what is available in an exercise. I'm not in the context of a library. So if, uh, if you want to see a full implementation of an option monad, you can go to the funky repository and then it's everything there. So then afterwards, you can, I'll give you all the references. Okay? So the problem is when your methods start all return options, we will have a break in about 10 minutes. Man has got to do what a man has got to do. So you've got, if you have all your methods returning options, right? what's going to happen is that now you've got, you have a sum of a sum. There's no good, right? Because if you do sum of a sum and then you do a map of another function, the, the value of the C there, the C variable there, has a sum card in it, and that's not what you want, right? You want the card. You with me? Yes. So, if you want to map something, and then you want to flat things afterwards, who do you want to call? Close no. no. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> if you want to map and then flat, <coughs> You want to call the flat map. <laughs> but it was close enough. Yeah, flat map will map through something and then flat at the end. So you, instead of having a sum sum, you could just have one sum. Okay? That way, you can have your methods return options and not worry that you're going to get a sum of a sum. You with me? And that's what monads add to functors. Monads are smarter and richer implementation, where functor is just a, an abstraction over a value. Like you have a, a list is like an abstraction over the value of the list. Uh, option is an abstraction over the value of the option. A monad is an abstraction over a computation. Now you can, you can start seeing that you can comp make computations link to each other. You can abstract over computations. That's what monad is. If someone asks you, what is a monad? Can you explain? Of course, it's just an abstraction over a computation. So simple. <laughs> so simple. So you, now you can do that because you got flat map. It's amazing. Look at that. You got flat map. Now, flat map looks exactly the same as the map in the signature, but that F there, the callable that you receive, will not return just a value, will return a value inside of a monad as well. That's the difference. In the map, the F will return a value. In the flat map, the F will return a monad, just like the monad that you have. So if, you, if this is an option, the F should return an option, okay? Okay? And, and then you've got magic happens. F must return an option. And then get card can return an option, and you still get a sum card. Awesome. And this, this now can be written in terms of monads, which is not an improvement, but wait. Wait. <laughs> That's sugar. That's sugar. All functional programming have sugar around monads. All from functional programming languages have sugar around monads because monad is everywhere. It's what you use to build computation, write computation. So there is a for comprehension preprocessor. I'm going to give you all the links at the end, don't worry. So this becomes hold and behold. Boom. Now, if you're not crying right now, I, you're not my friend. <laughs> this is so beautiful. You can read the code, right? You can put the, you get, get the user into a, a, a variable. You can put the card into a variable. You can get the amount into an A. 
And you can say, oh, this looks exactly like imperative programming. It's like you're assigning value to variables. Only, I have, I have no ifs, I have no nos. Right? It's pure computation description. I'm just describing what my program is supposed to do. And that's how grown-ups write programs. Okay? It's not... <laughs> It's not anymore like you, when we learn programming, we have you know, step by step, telling the computer what to do. No, just describe what you want. Tell what you want. Forget about errors, forget about everything. Tell the computer what you want. And if right, this is what you're looking for all your life. I know you're searching for this all your life. Now you're taking the red pill. It's all on you. <laughs> okay. You can. You can replace that by that. Have any questions? Come in next. <laughs> Lesson four. Now we're going to talk about lean domain modeling and then domain blocks in the lifestyle. All right. So first is this idea of a domain model. Right? The first thing to know is that we, nobody knows the truth. We all think what we know is right and what the other person thinks is wrong, and that is wrong, which proves that we are wrong. So all we have are maps to the reality. We don't have the reality. We have an understanding of reality, and that is a map to the things around us. When we go to a business, vis visit business, to, to kind of get the software for them, these are business who have been running for 20 years, sometimes 100 years, 100 years. And we go there to learn about that domain, and after two or three workshops, we think we know how they, how they work, how they operate, and all the policies and all that kind of thing. We don't. We build maps to try and understand that reality. And uh, it's a good idea to have easy, communicable maps that other people can look at and say, yes, that's how my business works. Yes, I, uh, you understand. Yes, that's, that's, that's what we do these, here. How this process works, that's correct. That's how we move from thing, one thing to another. This is maps. This are, a model is a map. Think about a model as a map to a context. Just map is not the territory. Say you are, you are in Detroit, and you've got a map of Chicago. Someone told you it's a map of Detroit. And then you're trying to get somewhere with that map. <laughs> What's going to happen? Disaster. You're going to get killed. Easily. So says Trump. So you've you got to have the right map, or you're going to have at least a map that is close enough to the territory that it can operate on that territory. You with me? So that's, what, that's why modeling is so important. It's not about who is right. It's not about getting the, the right model. It's, it's about being useful. Models are good for their utility, not for their accuracy. We want, we want a model that you can use to talk to the business that you are helping uh, with software. And you don't want to map the entire business domain either. You just want selected aspects, and usually core aspects of the business domain. And that's, where DDD, that's what DDD was designed to be. Um, so you isolate the core parts of your domain, and you can do that with uh, robust software. And if you do that correctly, the other parts you know, can, can survive around it. The core of your domain, you want to map it correctly. Uh, that's what, that's what the, the Blue Book is all about. It's like uh, tackling software complexity at the core of your domain. So it's not about, it's not about uh, mapping the entire business, a selected aspects of the business, and it's not about mapping a solution 
to the business problem. It's about mapping the problem. And this is something people don't get right usually when they're doing DDD. They think DDD is about writing the solution, writing entities or aggregates or event storming and, uh, or event sourcing. Or it's not, DDD is not about the solution. DDD is about the problem, mapping the problem domain properly, communicating with the domain experts and understanding that, and then modeling with software. Okay? So we typically use rich domain models for, for doing that. Rich domain models are very useful because they go really well with what we learned in school. We learn to code in an imperative way, we learn to code with object-oriented way. So rich domain models are very compatible with that. And that is really good if you're learning DDD. Uh, you go all through all the, 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 the tactical implementation of DDD, entities, factories, services, all those things can be implemented with classes. Okay? Rich domain models uh, mod, uh, are domain models in, that try to keep together the idea of state and behavior. So you've got some state and behavior together, and a good way to think of it is to think of classes. So domain-driven design was developed in the early 2000s. 2003 was written the book, and this work was heavily influenced by the work of a, a lady called Rebecca Withbrooks. She wrote a paper in the 80s, and, uh, and she was the first one to call the first ever uh, driven uh, DD things, one of the first ever DD things. So it's responsibility-driven design. And the book of Eric uh, Evans is incredibly influenced by this idea, which, uh, you know, you, you've got the ideas like the tell, don't ask. You're supposed to instantiate an object and then have a message sent to, to, that, to, that, to those objects. You're interested in the behavior of objects, right? So not treating objects like bags of data uh, or writing structs in C and then have this main um, function that calls all the functions in your code and then you have this stack full of function calls and a uh, you have the global state in the structs, which code that we all have written in the past. And relational databases just help us perpetuate this model by uh, the, the idea of relations. A relation is what we know as a table. And you have relations and you have relationships. And a relation has a, um, a number of attributes, right? So a table has fields, okay? And when people coming from, and after 1970, 1970 is when relational databases were, were created. And up until almost today, Applications are written like this. So you look at your database, and the database um, becomes the application. And people are writing a class, one entity for each table, more or less. And there was like there was a movement in like you know, when the Rails was very popular. Uh, there was a, the Active Record patterns where you have exactly a one-to-one -one relationship. And then Martin Fowler wrote that book, The Patterns of the Enterprise, to try and break a little bit with that. But still, there's a strong relationship between your entity relationship model and your application uh, layer. And this was heavily condemned by Rebecca Withbrooks in her paper. And she, she was uh, presenting an alternative to that, which is don't use data-driven uh, development, use responsibility-driven design, uh, de de design. And that's where domain-driven design shines, because when you write domain-driven design, you're thinking about the behaviors. And your entities should have behavior, and your services should be about behavior. You're trying to tackle the behaviors of the, of the business. Okay? So a uh, well-written aggregate should have proper um, actions in it. Or you have alternative uh, patterns of, like the command queries, where you have commands which are Again, behavior. You're interested in the behavior. You're not interested in having, and there was a, a problem of the first round of DDD 
people who first read, read the blue book wrote those entities, especially in the Java community, where and Hibernate, uh, using the Hibernate library, where you have entity with synonymous to getters and setters, right? Who wrote code like that? We all did. Come on, raise your hand. Yeah, this is like all over again. Your code has become, uh, you know, like those C code back in the day, where you have access to global variables everywhere. That's what uh, you know, an entity with getters and setters is. It's just Hey, I'm here, change me. Do whatever you want with me, I'm free. And then, what's the problem of that? The problem of that is that if you can change the states of your things from everywhere in your application, you will change the states of things from everywhere in your application. Just picture this, and I get to, I got the whiteboard. <laughs> nice. So here's an entity that has a relationship with another entity. So A has B. That has a C, that has a D, right? So you, you can do code like A, and then get B, and then from B you, you can get the C, like get C. Come on, you don't, you all done that, right? And then get D, and then to make matters worse, you you, you put in an if here, and depending. On the result of that, you do some stuff, right? Come on, you all have done that. So the problem with this, and this is what, what she's writing about in her book, this is the data-driven approach, is that now this, this upper-level module know about this lower-level primitive, knows how this guy operates, and is making decisions for it. So if you change this code, and this is going to be the same for when you have an E, has an F, and this both has a G. What happens if you change G? Boo! Two things happen. Fragility and rigidity. Fragility is, so because you can call getters everywhere, you change this guy, you have to go back and look where you call getters everywhere to see if everything makes sense to you. So you're going to look like, you know, those tubes of waters that uh, there's some leaking here, you put your hand here, and you close, and, there's, and then some leaking starts here, and then you put your feet there, and then there's some leaking on the top. Hey, <laughs> Have you done fixing bugs everywhere? You fix it in one place and breaks in somewhere else, right? This is called fragility. Fragility. And the other thing that this results in is rigidity. So rigidity is when the project managers come to you and say, can we change that? And then you say, no. It's a rewrite. Right? So this is because you're exposing state. So the idea of DDD is not that. The idea of DDD is very centered on behavior. The first wave of DDD got it wrong, and they got it right. So I was always attracted to this idea of behavior driven um, and responsibility driven. And uh, that's what I kind of dive so much with so much strength into TDD. Rich domain models approach programs functionally. Um, so, yeah. So we're talking about we're talking about rich program programming models. Now we're going to talk about lean programming models. So the lean domain models. This is the lean domain models. Is an alternative to rich domain models, where we will approach the program functionally. The beauty the beauty of a function is that nothing can be as fundamental as a unit of behavior as a function. We are looking for behavior. Right? That's what we're looking for our entire lives. What's the behavior? And a, an object has, you know, when, you, when you're writing things ob object oriented, you think, where does the be behavior go? In that class or in that class? You never know, right? According to the, to the uh, tell, don't ask principle, the behavior should go where the state is. But then you ask, where should the state go? <laughs> You are, it's a, it's a mess. 
You don't know. You sometimes you're struggling how to what, decide where the behavior and the state goes. Very complicated. When you have fun the function approach, just write the function. Forget about the state. Just write the function. If you get this, you get that. And then you can write descriptions of your domain very, very clearly. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the place, the algebraic data types, plays in this. We can build on the shoulder of giants. Other people have built very powerful ADTs. We can use them, make it very expressive of domain objects. And we're going to use compelling static models techniques. They're very easy, very easy to kind of collaborate with other dom uh, domain experts as well. Domain objects lifetime, we're going to look how do they live in an FP context, how do you create them, how do you, how do you use them, and how do you persist them. <clears throat> so let's look first how we would model things in a rich domain. Say you have that domain that we've been talking about. This is the loyalty cards. Have you got loyalty cards? You have not got... Uh, some people do. Okay. Okay. It's, this is, you're not loyal people? <laughs> so I'm only loyal to coffee. coffee. I have loads of coffee loyalty cards. But uh, the other ones at the shops, I don't have. Them. So here's a scenario. I already explained before, but like, just to first to be clear, accounts can be green, gold, or close. And accounts can top up. You can order. You can return items at the cafe. And when, you, when they order drink, among other products, uh, they earn a star for each drink they order. When you earn 15 stars, then you can claim a drink for free. If you earn 50 stars in one year, then you are upgraded to the gold card. Gold accounts only need 10 stars to get a free drink. You need to earn 50 stars in every year to keep your account, otherwise you're downgraded. So if you're doing something in the reach domain model, you're not going to do exactly this one, but you're going to do something like that, where you have an aggregate and you have a number of other entities and, and value objects around it. Correct? That's how we do stuff. Or if you, you may use something like command query or events or something similar. Correct? But what you see is that you got that behavior on your aggregate that you can call you can, uh, and then you, the, the aggregate has to have state as well, and it has to be serve as an entry point. That's an aggregate root of the, your aggregate. Everything here is an aggregate. The entity there is an aggregate root for the, this aggregate. And then you can ask things to that entity, and the entity is an entry point for that aggregate. Everybody familiar with that? Or if you're not familiar, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah? Okay. So one of the other things of rich domain models is that this change in place. You have to keep track of the state on every entity. So you've got put the, the values on all the entities and you change in place all the time. So there's a lot of mutability happening in your model. And, and then you have to you know, use something like uh, units of work to make, keep track of your entities, make sure that they are uh, consistent all the time, they have the, you know, you, you're flushing them into the repository so they have the right state, all of that, right? Now, so all of us are in the information technology industry, correct? So I will define information. Information is a place where you can put some stuff there and then change and then put some other stuff there and then go there, take it and then every time you go there, there's something different. Right? Who is uncomfortable with that definition? <laughs> right? But that's how we treat information. <laughs> We treat them with these identifiers where we put stuff that they're not facts. What is a fact? A fact is something that is. Right? I, in the beginning, I was asking Alexa, Alexa, who is the president of the United States? And she says, it's Donald Trump. <laughs> Next morning, Alexa, who is the president? It doesn't matter how many times I ask, Alexa always gave me the same painful fact. 
Donald Trump is the president of the United States. But I cannot change that. It's immutable. <laughs> huh? Yes. I, well, I can write a, a, a task and replace a, a Alexa task. But that's, that's facts. You know, it may not be what we want to hear, but that's facts. You don't change facts. It's immutable. Information is synonymous to facts. Our industry is information technology, which means we're supposed to be coding with immutability. That's the value of values. Values are immutable. They don't change. You can trust them. If you want to hear more about this point being made, this is a talk given by this gentleman, which is Rich Hackey. He talks about the value of values, and he evolves that idea on how if you write programs with um, you know, classes, when, every time you write a class, you're creating a type, and you're making more and more your program uh, hard to be written in another language, because you're creating types that don't exist in other languages. Whereas if you use values of very fundamental types, like a map, a class very often is a map, or if you use tuples, or if you use you know, um, lists, these are things that are available in every language. So he makes that point. It's very interesting. Go and watch it. And another aspect of lean modeling is the, the purity you get when you do things this way. We talked about purity early, where you know, you know what, you, the, what is behavior? What's the definition of behavior? Behavior is the rules pro, of, the, of changing some input into some output. Right? And that's, isn't that what we're talking about when we talk about purity? Isn't it? So if you think about your program this way, think about your program this way. Say you're, you're writing a, you're writing a, um, a mobile, you're selling mobile tariffs online, right? So you go to a website, you choose a device, and you choose a tariff, right? And then, and then you go, the next step is a, a plan, and then you go, get an order at the end. Okay? Everybody understands that, that domain, right? You have mobile phones. <laughs> so you go, so when you're choosing a mobile phone online, you go, I'm gonna, I want this device, I want this plan, and this is your topo, your A. Your A is just two things, which is a device and a, and a tariff. And then you go to the next thing that gives you a plan, and go to the next thing which gives you an order, and you go to the next thing that gives you... That's how you think about programs. It's a transformation of data. That's, that's what programs are, transformation of data. But you, you're not changing things in place. You're transforming them, transforming them into other things. That, that's what a map is doing. I'm getting something, I'm giving something completely new. I'm not trans, trans, putting anything in place. Okay? So that's the idea of um, functional modeling, is to change things in place, things of things in terms of states, that you, you, a state that you can be changed and transformed rather than replaced. Okay? So... That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing some lean modeling. As opposed to the uh, rich models, you have the state completely separate to your, to your behavior, and they are immutable state. Okay? You're not going to even worry about the state. You're not going to even think about the state. You're just going to write your behaviors. You're going to wire them all together, and right at the very end, you give the state. And the state is going to run through the description of your program and do what you need to do. And, and this is how we're going to talk about when we talk about how you, we persist objects right at the end. Okay? Sometimes you have more than one context. You have, um, in your company, you, you have different contexts. You need to map the context of your application. Okay, uh, we got uh, this part here is all accounting, this part here is all human resources, for example. And they have they have similar concepts with the same name, but they mean different things in different contexts. Okay? You're, you're familiar with that? Yeah? So that's called bounded context. And you'd have the, the same principle in, uh, uh, applies inside of each of the bounded contexts. But when you get to communicate between bounded contexts, you need to use some sort of messaging exchange, which we're not going to cover today. But if you want to get into that, you should look into reactive programming and other techniques for, for achieving that. 
<clears throat> so today we're going to talk about the modeling inside of the boundary context only. Okay, so we start with the behavior. Start with the behavior. And what is the behavior? We saw the scenario already. Yeah, rewarding loy loyalty accounts. And we start with thinking what are the services here and how I would, would like, how I would like to kind of group together some of these verbs into the, uh, like a subset of services that I want to pack together. So what, what are the services that I have here? So I have these verbs, I can earn a star, I can claim a drink, and they kind of seem good together. Earn a star and claim a game, like, they, you know, it's a part of the same part of the business. So that's, I want to group together in a service. There's all, all the other part that there that to do with the order, the top, top up, and you know, keeping your balance, which is the order uh, service. But I'm gonna call this the rewarding or the reward service. So you identify the services and you try to map out what are the activities of that service. And then you create a, uh, like this, like a circle, put the name of the service in, and then list the activities of that service. Very simple. The gentleman in the cafe, they can look at this and they can understand. Reward, I can earn and I can claim. You can start talking about what else do you do there. You can very quickly map those things out. For us, it's also very easy to translate that into an interface. Okay? And then we can start looking for prototypes in it. Okay. I, I, I need uh, an account, and I need to have an ID, and stars, and amount. That's fine. And I might need another, another, another uh, product type, which is a product, by coincidence. Because uh, when, I, when I'm claiming, I need to have a drink. And then you map those things out like that, just symbols of an account and a symbol of a product, and then you can get the attributes of each of the product types. And how do you do some types? So this is particularly useful if you're doing things that go from one state to another. For example, the green card. The green card, I can close the green card anytime, so there's an error for the green card to the close card. Right? This is how you also model um, states in the state machines, right? If you're familiar with machine learning. So you can do green to close. You can go to green to gold if you upgrade. You can go from gold to green if you downgrade. And you can also go from gold to close. And any time you earn a star, you just stay on a green unless you're upgrading. So that's how you could model us, uh, the sum types of the account, okay? The account is a tag of a sum type. We call it a tag when it's like the parent, okay? Sometimes these sum types are also called tagged union because of that, okay? <clears throat> and then you've seen that implementation before, and if you just look at the account, you can see how we model that. Questions? Yeah. Is there a reason why you can go from gold back to gold to earn stars? Yes, you, yeah, you could. Oh. It's just, yeah, in a, I missed that. But in a conversation, you could capture that as well. Anything else? You've got paper. I didn't think you'd have paper. This is wonderful. I'm, I'm just going to let you try, and then I give, you, I give you five minutes to try this, and then we can uh, wrap up together if you, if you don't go very far. Um, just um, one thing that's interesting about this exercise, I'm going to read the exercise together with you to make sure that you understand. 
So this is the claiming work expenses. So you're going, you're going to a conference, for example, and your company lets you claim the expenses if you spend money with food or travel or anything like that. You can go back, show the receipts, and then you'll pay money back with you at the end of the month. Um, so the expenses can be of food, travel, accommodation, or any other kind of expenses. And the expenses have a cost and they have a date. Uh, you can claim a, an expense sheet, which is a list of ex expenses, and the claim can be pending, can be approved, rejected, or paid. Staff can add expenses to a sheet at any time, so you can add expenses to a sheet and not claim it, and you can claim later. Only approved, unpaid claim can be paid. So you. You can see the order of the states going on here. Okay, so the claim is a very interesting. It's a very interesting uh, some type to uh, model. So if you jump straight into the claim and just, uh, try to model the claim some type before you model the expense um, in any way or form. All right. Is there any question about exercise? You're not supposed to write code on this one. You're supposed to use the paper and the pencil and model it. We've got a flip chart here. If you've got one of those that work, they're great for this kind of thing. Get, get up off your desk, go to a whiteboard, and do a little bit of modeling before you sit down and write the code. Find out very refreshing and the ideas kind of flow. I have, I have one at home now. I used to have three of them. Last year, I, was, I made a commitment to myself to learn a general relativity. And yeah, I, had, uh, I was looking for a new girlfriend, so I had to uh, get rid of the whiteboards because it was weird to bring a data home. I had all those formulas and the <laughs> put them off, so I had to get rid of my whiteboards. But I, I like whiteboards a lot, so I've got just one now. And ironically, it was given to me by my new girlfriend. <laughs> so I, I'm not doing general relativity, relativity anymore. I'm now into group theory and series. <laughs> Okay, so what can we model here? We can model, we could model the service of claiming exp exp expenses. We can model the prototypes. There's an expense prototype, there is a claim prototype, and there is the claim some type as well. Okay? Uh, so you could start the conversation with the, the service, you put a circle there and say, okay, let's talk about claiming expenses. What, what things happen here? Tell me the, 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 things that, the actions that happen when you, people are claiming expenses. Oh, they can, they can add the expense to, a, to an expense sheet. And it's, you know, bullet points. Things that business people understand. <laughs> what else? Oh, they can claim the expenses. It doesn't have to be in order. Okay, claim. Uh, they can claim without, without it being approved. Uh, yeah, well, they, when they claim, then the boss needs to approve. Oh, so approving. Approve. Okay, and once it's approved, then what happened? Then, you know, it, it can be rejected as well. Oh, okay, reject. And what else? Oh, then they get paid. Okay, it's paid. Let's put the verbs there. And then, and then you start thinking, okay, wh what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, data you need to keep track of in this case? You need to, so when you add an expense, you add an expense to an expense sheet. So you need to create expenses. An expense would have a cost. Expense would have a date. Expense would have a type, which can be a some type as well, <laughs> right? This can be a some type: food, travel, accommodation, other. And it can. It doesn't say that, but it should have a, an expense. Should have a description. What is it that you're claiming? 
For example, you can say it's a, it's a travel, but you can say it was my taxi to the airport. You can put a description there. It's not there in the problem, so I'm not blaming you if you didn't get that. <laughs> and the claim itself is also a prototype that could be also be, be uh, described as a prototype, which has an expense sheet. If you want, you can keep the date of the claim as well, if that's important for your domain. The date here is particularly important because there's a rule that says you cannot claim an expense in the future. And there's also a rule in the domain that says that if the type is food, you can only claim if it's 25 pounds or smaller. But we're going to get to how to validate those rules in a second. Okay? Okay, now let's, talk, let's have a look on our states. So we've got first state. What is the first state? Pending. And pending can go to what? Can go to rejected or approved. Can you go to paid as well? No. Okay. Now, with rejected, can I go to paid? No. So now I can go to paid from here. Yeah? Okay. Now, these three, these three sum types are unpaid. Unpaid claims. Okay? And all these guys here, all of them, are what? Claim. Okay? You see, this is going to be very useful when you're writing the code, when you have this model written down. And what can you do here? You can, you can have conversations, okay, can, once I approve, can I reject? And you have conversations like that. No, you cannot reject after it's approved. It has to go only one route. Once it's approved, that's it. It has to get the money, for example. Or you can say, no, no, you can go from approved to rejected. The admin person can say, okay, I, I, there's a mistake with the, the, the values are not correct. The receipt and the, the value claimed are different and then go back to rejected. So these are conversations that you can have with the business, and you can map here on your domain model. Okay? And it makes writing the code much, much, much easier. All right? And it goes well with our functional structures as well. And that's all we have. We have, that's all we have. <laughs> we have services and we have very simple types. It's beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So then, let's have a look at the lifetime of these objects. They go through a lifetime. They have creation, participation, and then we need to, we need to persist them. All right? They get created, participation, and persistence. Creation, usually in, in enriched domain models, we have factories for that. Okay? Name constructors. Yeah? But we can do something similar, but with an added sugar of the applicatives. Applicatives is similar to what we have seen with the functors and the, and the monads. So this is the smart constructor idiom. Think of this as a, like a design pattern, like it's something our mind understands. It's a design pattern. OK, it's a design pattern. It's, I'm, I'm relaxed now. It's just a design pattern. It's easy. Okay. So you want to create, you wanna create a, an account. And the account can be created green or gold, right? So in your parent class, you can add this green card, gold card methods. They're static. They're going to they're gonna be used just like you use named constructors. Everybody familiar with named constructors? Yeah? OK. With an added sugar. So you can write these validation functions 
they will have very clear names on your domain. For example, I can only create a gold card if he's still qualified to be, have a, go, uh, a, a gold card. How do I know that someone is qualified to have a gold card? They have to have 50 stars in every year, okay? Then I can create that. So, get a, a date of the anniversary, get the stars that has been collected, and I will return a validation monad in this case. I'm not going to return, I'm not going to return the data that I'm validating, I'm returning the data that I'm validating inside of a validation monad. Okay? You're going to see why in a second. Don't worry about that. It's very, very easy. So I do my validations. If it's more than a year and the star collected is man, nah, 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 okay, you've been with us for more than a year, you don't have 50 stars anymore, uh, sorry, you didn't have 50 stars in this period, I'm going to send you back a failure. Okay? And you can wrap an exception that is not a problem. You're not throwing the exception, you're just sending it back inside of a failure. All right? Or you can return a success of the data that you're validating. Okay, this anniversary and the stack collectors are validated correctly. Good. And you're going to write validation methods like that for all, for all your business rules. These stars are correct. Uh, positive stars, I cannot have negative stars, for example. The amount is correct. I cannot have this, um, this amount. I have only that amount. And once you got all these validation rules written, you, you open your smart constructor, and you're gonna up, you, can, uh, you can use an apply method. An apply will get this every single method, every single result coming back from, which are coming inside of a monad, unwrap them and give that to a function that you give it to it as a second argument. Okay? Take everything out of the validation and put it into a function that you can use to create your objects in the end. Now, if it, any of those validations fail, you don't get your object. You just get a list of errors. Just exactly what you want. You get a list of all the validation errors that you have in, in your domain. And then you can use that validation to display errors on your forms or whatever you're using that for. Does that make sense? Very elegant, very elegant. And every single time you write a new application, you have to think about how to do this. You don't have to think anymore. Just use the, you know, the legacy of the gods. Stand on the giant of, in the shoulders of giants. Apply validations, and then return your objects. Okay? You can add your smart constructors, some repetition on the... Okay. Okay. So I think you've got a smart constructor there for the expense of food. It's a very simple example. Pay attention on, on what you need to validate. You can only expense food up to 25 euro, and you can assume the system only works in euro. That's only true of food. Other expenses can have a higher amount. All expenses need a date earlier than today's date. So that is already validated for you. You just need to add the logic for the amount of the food into your validator on exercise 5A. Okay? Should be straightforward. Everything is written there. You just need to add the validation that is missing. Exercise 5A. Let me know if you have any trouble. Right, so you're just looking into a new pattern, which is, so in case you're wondering, what if I have many things to map? Uh, if, like in this case, we, you, you're sending many values into a function instead of just one, okay? So that's, that's called apply, which is a method of the applicative uh, algebraic data type. So you're using uh, applicatives as well. Now, some of you, some of you went there and over-engineered your solution. Yes? Um, sorry, if I always push to implementation, 
Yeah. Yeah. I saw that you use a constant food yeah. that I could not really find. Is that on purpose? So food would probably be one some type, but I didn't get that far to implement the some type yet. So I just had something that I could make sense of. Uh, now some of you have noticed a few things, like what happened if my expense is exactly 25 pounds, or what happened if other things like you know uh, what happened if I pa pass an expense that is negative? How is the program going to deal with that? You're not testing for those things, are you? <laughs> you, you you're not. You're not, you're not going to check those things because what you're doing is something called example-based tests. Example-based test is as good as the developer. If you can remember, if you can think about scenarios to test and you test them, and your application is going to be as good as the scenarios that you can think of. <laughs> okay? But what about the scenarios they cannot think of? They have another name for those scenarios. They're called bugs. <laughs> okay? So there's an, a different approach for testing, particularly used when you're doing functional programming, because they're really good to test properties of types. So you, we're, we're modeling things, everything we're modeling is as types, and types, are like in the mathematical sense, they have properties. So you can talk about expense as some type that has some properties. So if you, just, if you start thinking like that, what are the properties of my expenses? If you ask that question, what are the properties of my expenses? Okay, and then you can describe the properties of your expenses. That way, you're defining the algebra of your domain as if you're you know, defining an, a mathematical algebra. It's so beautiful. Just like when you wrote your... You remember the mathematical teachers when he had those symbols, cryptic symbols on a board, he trying to explain some some ways that some set would work, and we, do, we have something like, uh, for all x that belongs to the, <laughs> remember this, that exist, a y also belong, <laughs> such as, <laughs> wasn't that cool when the teacher could write things like that and you wish you could as well? Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it like, whoa, I wish I could write like that. It's like, now how does it do that? I, I, can, I can understand when he's talking and writing it, but I would never come up you know, by myself and write those things when I was learning it. It was like cryptic. But it's nice to have a language like that. You can talk about the properties of your code in the same way. For example, in property-based tests, we write things this way. For all elements in my algebra, when there is a business constraint, then the property should hold true. Okay? It, it, forces, you to, it forces you to think of your, the elements of your domain as something that has properties. And when you think like that, you stop writing examples. You just define the property. And when you define the property, and the beauty of this thing is that you don't have to think of every single scenario because these libraries, there are libraries like this one, that you're going to have the, the link at the end, they generate elements of their, if you just describe, okay, my expense is made of this thing, which is an integer, this thing, there's a string, this thing, there's a float, this thing, there's a claim. And you can generate those things and like, create like a, loads of those and test your code with all of them. <laughs> and anticipate errors that you have not seen before. Isn't that great? Also, these things come equipped with assertions that you can try different assertions with, uh, with your thing. Okay? This is the vanilla areas that comes with uh, with a trait for PHP unit, so you can use inside of PHP units like that. And when you run it, it will fail in some case and will show you where it fail. Oh, you, if I have a string like that, it will not work. So it's not every string, it has to be a string that looks like a name somehow. Okay? I wrote a runner for this tool. This tool is called Aries. So there's a, my implementation, it's just a runner on top of that. 
that lets you write it like this. It, it doesn't require um, PHP unit or PHP spec or column or anything. You can just write the properties in a, in a file and you can just run errors run to a directory where all those files are. And you go one by one and run the property. So in this case, got a property. You can put a description of, the, of what is it that you're testing. Gold card holders must collect 50 stars a year. For all, generate the date, generate an integer. For all dates and integers, there are in that particular constraint, stars are um, less than 50, and it's more than a year, then the reward gold card should be right. Okay? That holds. That property holds. When the method is right, is the method of the validation class that can tell you whether you know, the validation is right or left. Okay? So this is returning a validation class that you can check. Questions about this slide? Yeah? Um, this actually runs in this other test framework, right? If I realize it's like a, just a, a nice to have, but does yeah. it actually create enable test pages? Uh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't generate any stuff. It's just, it's just that. It uses a Mozart, a web Mozart uh, assert uh, library, and it, it has a nice uh, wrapper around the generators to create those uh, yeah, it syntax. The generator works like a data provider, for example. No, it just uses the generators that exist in areas, but I have a wrapper, a nice wrapper around it. Yeah? So you can write more, you can just focus on writing properties and worry, no, not worry about the testing framework. Yes, but you should be able to create your own generators as well. I've done some of the, those examples in Funky. So the, there are some property-based tests in Funky if you want to have a look on how I, di I did that. I create my own generators so I could get away with constraining the way I, I wanted. There's also, they also have something called shrink in the library, which allows you to constrain even further. Yeah? OK. This is your homework, take a picture. I'm going to also send this slides to you so you don't have to take a picture. <laughs> but the homework is uh, make, writing a property-based test to the test that you've written, so that you, you, you know the example-based test that, that it was written just now, the one that you did on 5A. You have to write the property-based test version of it, and now you, have to conv you, you will see that the negative expense amount will come up, and, and when they, uh, it's exactly like 25 euros, or what happened when the date is on the future, things like that. Any questions? Cool. Yeah? It's a convention, yeah. It doesn't have to be. The either monad, it's not a validation monad. So you can put whatever you want on the left, whatever you want on the right. But the validation monad is more likely restrict because the left one is called failure, the right one is called success. Participation of the domain objects is in the service. So first you just start by writing the service down. Don't put any properties in it, just write the names of them. And then you start putting some types there as you're having conversations about that. And once you have a number of those things, and they are all going to return monads. We're going to look into the monads that they're going to return in a second. They're called reader monads. But the thing you can do is that you can, you can now, for example, I can order something, and I can order something again, and then I can top up, and then I can do all of these operations in series. And I can kind of write that operation as a for comprehension like this, so your program becomes more composable. So you can write bigger servers composed of a smaller service, right? That thing that you always promised your boss, that it's reusable, we can reuse on the next project, becomes true because you can compose larger applications with smaller services that you write, okay? And you can persist this thing with the reader monad. The reader monad is something that we saw right very early in the day 
It's a class that encapsulates a, 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 a callable. So you, you pass the callable in a construction where you create the reader. And then when you call run, you will call that callable. You, um, but this is a monad, which means that you can, you can compose with other readers. And you, so you need to implement the map and the flat map to do that. And what does that give you is that um, you have to implement your services to return readers. OK? And the reader will take a function that takes whatever is the state of your application. It could be a repository, it could be uh, memory. So here is in this example, you see that the for comprehension does not do anything. If you are a good f functional programmer, you're going to feel very good by the time you get a line six and your program does absolutely nothing. This is something that we all enjoy. Write a program that does nothing. Functional programmers love that. And then, at the end, you just pass the repository, which has your state and all the side effects to it. And you, you know the run method would then call a function that takes the other repository and does whatever it needs to do. Now, in case you're wondering how does that look like, do I have code for that? I can show you the code somewhere else. Yeah, I'll show you the code on my ID. So actually, you can see on the end-to-end the -end solution. Are you seeing my screen? No, I have to go there. So you can see that when you implement the end-to-end -end clean express interpreter, when you write your readers, I'm not sure you can see that. Can you see it? So you see your reader, so your, your add method, for example, will return a reader that will take, that will take the repository that's passed on uh, at the end and do whatever destructive that needs to be done. And, and, but that doesn't run. That doesn't run until the end of the application when you actually call the reader to do that. Okay? So all those little methods here in your domain, they will return, they will return readers of whatever similar monad you want to use for these buttons, but this is like the simplest possible way to implement this. You return a reader that takes your stateful object, in this case a repository, and it will save the repository, or if there uh, is an error, we will return the list of errors. Okay? Going back to slides. And these are the references for you to dive and look more and learn more about this topic. This is a book entirely on the topics of today. If you want to read the book, the book explains every single part of the things that we went on today. It does not cover functional programming, so you need to read a book on functional programming as well. And what did we do today? We, we had an FP intro, algebraic data types. We talked about composition a lot, how to compose, how to think about our functional programs as composition. We did some domain modeling together. You, you did some domain modeling yourselves. And we looked at how the domain objects will live within a functional programming. There is a competition going on for the best workshop. Vote for us, because we were the best. <laughs> we were the best. <laughs> and give feedback on joined in. Take a picture. And you're the best. Thank you. <laughs>